The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies, came upon me, they stumbled upon me and they fell. Though one host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing, like this sister up front right now, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. all the days of my life and inquire and inquire in his temple. Another word for inquire young people is to have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles and he will hear your faintest cry. And he'll answer by and by. Amen. Amen. We must thank God for the music ministry of Mount Calvary Baptist Church. We thank God for the newlywed Josh on the keys, the maturely wed Chris on the bass, our brother Eric on the drums, and I saw Minister Jennifer McKell, Spotify, Apple Music, M-E-K-E-L. She was up here singing with a blue dress. Pastor Brandy, Funeral Home Wilkerson, Funeral Home Wilkerson. Administrator extraordinaire, Mrs. Tiffany Campbell. My teacher, no matter how old she gets and how many kids she teaches in school. Her mama named her Erin Robinson, but she'll always be my little E-Rob. So thank God for her singing. Who did I miss up here? Who did I miss? Somebody else was singing. Oh, I can't remember, forget Darren. The dude was holding it down, y'all. Yes, yes, Darren. Listen, y'all don't know. See, y'all looking at me. I'm gonna deal with a little bit of housekeeping and we'll get into the message. Some of y'all, I ain't a mind reader, but some of y'all online and in present, in person, Darren, they thinking to themselves, I'm reading minds right now. Reverend Streeter, that orange hoodie you got on is so loud, I might need earplugs. Just bright. But see, Darren, that's my kind of brother right there. See his hat? He the only one that wore a hat to match what I got on. And I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Thank God for you for singing and doing what you all do. Amen? Amen. Most of all, I thank God for Jesus. Mary's child, God's one and only son. His name literally means he saves us from our sins. That's what his name means. And I need to be saved from my sins. So I thank God for Jesus. I thank God for our senior pastor and first lady, Pastor, Ed, pastor Jeffrey Dennis, and First Lady birthday yesterday, Angela Dennis. Yes, yes, yes. And the whole First Family here at Mount Calvary Baptist Church. Sierra, John, the babies, Alicia, Evis, all of them. Kyle way up in Cleveland. Didn't he preach last week, Kyle, early? Amen. Pastor Dennis got a new generation of preachers in his family, and that's a good thing. So I thank God for the first family, Mount Calvary Baptist Church, and I also thank God for my first lady and the first family on my street. My wifey for lifey. My wifey for lifey. My Lisa, also known as a Lisa, but she my Lisa. Somebody say, ain't no woman like the one I got. Ain't no Lisa like the Lisa I got. Our daughters, Julie Dees, Steffi J., and our only begotten son, Isaiah, Isaiah, Manny, Manuel, Street of the First. Y'all greet him next month. He'll be 18. Amen, amen. Closer and closer to being grown and gone. 
but not too far, homie. Want to reach out and touch you every now and then. Greetings to you, Mount Calvary, in the words of the Saturday Night Live comedian Billy Crystal. You look marvelous. And that's saying something, because y'all been fasting for what? January the 8th, or what's the day? 22nd? So far, that's what, 14 days, two weeks? And y'all look good. Give yourself a round of applause. And thank your God for keeping you standing, even though you done gave up a whole lot over these past two weeks. We got one more week to go, am I right? I think we can run on a little while longer. The theme for this year at Mount Calvary Baptist Church is reset and re-energize. Ah, yes. Reset and re-energize. Darren has on the shirt that matches my, my, my hoodie as well. My sister over here has on the shirt, and you can get a shirt later on. But it's reset and re-energize. We need to every now and then be reset. And I don't know if any of y'all like me, but man, I need to be re-energized. Every day. Two, three, four, five, six times a day. So, what we're going to do is we're going to read a scripture. We're going to pray. You all will sit down. I'm going to stand up for a little while. And that passage of scripture is found in Psalm 32. Psalm chapter number 32. And we're going to read in your hearing just a few verses. Not all of the chapter. Just a little bit to get the context of what we have to say. Five short verses from Psalm 32, verse 1 through 5. Is that all right? Amen. All right. Psalm 32, verse 1 through 5. On the screen, it starts at 3 through 5, but we're going to read in your hearing starting at verse number 1. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience, this is the NLT, New Living Translation, Oh, what joy for those whose obedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight, with an exclamation point right there. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refuse, verse 3, when I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Some versions say interlude, others say selah. Selah means pause and think about what you just read. Lastly, verse number five. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Pray with me before you guys sit down, and we're going to talk about my guilt is gone. That's the title for the elders, my guilt is gone. For the babies among us, you might say, oops, I made a boo-boo. Oops, I made a boo-boo. Let's pray. Our great God and Father, in the mighty name of your Son, our Savior, we still call him Jesus Christ the righteous, King of kings, Lord of lords, your one and only Son. Thank you for sending him our way and changing our lives. Now, Lord, use this message to change our lives even more. Take us from glory to glory to glory and make us better when we walked out than we were when we first walked in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You all may take your seats. Oops! I made a boo-boo. Some of my seven-year-olds know something about that. Elders who've experienced the gift, the forgiveness of God, who've made boo-boos as well, were able to say, my guilt 
is gone. All right, so that Psalm 32 will focus on these three verses, three through five. But before we get into the verses, we have to deal with what's written before the verses even start. What you talking about, preacher? Well, this is a psalm, P-S-A-L-M. Somebody asked, well, what exactly is a psalm? The book of Psalms is a collection of 150 poems, or songs, if you will. They are poems of lament, which is a word that simply means mourning. And if you've ever lost somebody in your life, you know what it's like to mourn and lament. They are didactic, which is a fancy theological word, educational word, that simply means teaching. They teach. They are prayers, some are prayers, like St. Francis of Assisi. Some of y'all may have heard of him. He wrote a prayer, a poem, if you will, about 800 years ago. It was called the Serenity Prayer. In his little prayer, he said, Lord, give me the courage to change the stuff I can change, the serenity or the peace to accept the things I can't change, and give me the wisdom to know the difference. That little prayer has helped countless brothers and sisters recovering from addiction all over the world. And it was written by a preacher about 800 years ago named St. Francis from a city called Assisi in Italy. That's why they call him St. Francis of Assisi. And if you ever forget his name, can't remember who wrote that poem, that psalm, if you will, that wrote, was written about 800 years ago. That's a city in California that's got his name from St. Francis of Assisi. One of the biggest, most prosperous cities in the world is called San Francisco. And it was named after a preacher who wrote poetry 800 years ago. Some of the Psalms you find in the Bible are praise and joyous celebrations. Like Maya Angelou, she was a poet laureate. She was known worldwide, nationwide, great woman of God, and her skin looked like mine, by the way. And she wrote a song called Still I Rise, a poem called Still I Rise. And many of the ladies in the room, your auntie will read it to you later on as a psalm, she, a poem she wrote called Phenomenal Woman. And every man in this room knows at least one phenomenal woman. Amen? Amen. So the psalms are mourning sometimes, they're teaching, sometimes they're preaching, sometimes they're praise and joyous. At one of the elementary schools here in Akron this week, Minister Jennifer was teaching about poetry by a black poet named Nikki Giovanni and how her poetry inspires people. And one of the students pulled me to the side, one about fifth grader, and he asked me, Pastor Jack, because they call me Pastor Jack in schools, Pastor Jack, is poetry like rapping? Because sometimes, you know, poetry be rhyming and stuff. I mean, these guys, they got like bars. When the kids say they got bars, that mean they can rap. So I informed him that yes, rapping can be a form of poetry. But rap, mu rap music turns 50 years old this year. This year, the 50th anniversary of rap music. The hip, the hop, the hippie, y'all know that. Run DMC, LL Cool J, Salt and Pepper, y'all got that. However, poetry, somebody say poetry, poetry, is thousands of years old. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter two. After God created Eve for Adam, Adam looked at a Danny drag and he got happy. And he spoke a poem a poem of love. And he said, he looked around at all the animals, the male animals had the female animals, the male horses had the female horses, but he saw this that God just made for him, and he got happy. And he said a poem. You know it's a poem because when you read it in your Bible, it has a lot of indents in the verse. And he said this poem. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. He was happy. And he called a woman, Brother Chris. He looked at what God created, and he said, whoa, man. Whoa, man. Whoa, man. 
poetry is old, y'all. Some poems are studied and read for years and years and years because there's interpretations and understandings to be received from them years and centuries to come. This psalm we're reading in Psalm 32 is a type of poem or a type of psalm. At the beginning of your, in your Bible, it says maybe Psalm 32. And then right next to it, you might see a little note that says a masco, M-A-S-K-I-L. On your computers and phones, it might be a little footnote. If you touch the link, it'll bring up what masco means. And a masco psalm is simply a psalm that teaches, remember that word didactic, it teaches us how God wants us to live. And that is where we are today. Psalm 32, a masco, a poem. Date and location of the text that we find ourselves in. The text was first written about 3,000 years ago. That's also known as 1,000 BC. BC is before Christ, so 1,000 years before Christ came on the scene, this poem was written. So for us, about 3,023 years ago or so. It was written in a country called Israel in what is now known as the Middle East. The people who lived there were known as Hebrews. Today we call them Jews. And now they don't just live in Israel, they live all over the world with a high concentration in New York City of the United States. At the time of the text, they had recently become a country with their own land and with their own land and with their own king. Before this, they were primarily nomads. They just traveled all over the area from one place to the next with no permanent home. And they had to fight other stronger countries, stronger nations, just about everywhere they went. Beginning with their greatest leader, Moses, leading 2.2 million Hebrews out of slavery in ancient Egypt through the Red Sea. But at the time of this text, somebody say this text. At the time of this text, now they had their own country, and Israel was the country and the capital was Jerusalem. The United States is the country. The capital is Washington, D.C. The author, we got to deal with this author. In your Bibles, it says Psalm 32. And right, up, right below that, it may say a psalm of who? David. Now, somebody said, who is, who is David? Is that little D.D. from down the street around the way? Who is, who is, who, who is David? David, he was the youngest of eight brothers, call him baby bro. He was a young shepherd boy. He killed a lion and a bear when they attacked his sheep as a kid. He was awesome. He was a great worshiper, like y'all saw up in here right now. Little David knew how to do that as a little kid. He was a giant killer. Goliath, six, nine, nine, six. I don't know how tall he was. But it's much bigger than David. David knocked the dude out, cut off his head, and say, look at me now. He fought the giant and won. He was a great and mighty warrior as an adult. He became a great musician, Josh, on a kind of ancient guitar, Chris, that soothed people with emotional problems. He knew how to make music that made people feel good. He was a great prophet. He became the greatest king Israel had ever known with many, many military victories which resulted in peace all across the land. In the Bible, God has a comment on David. He says, David was a man after God's own heart. This dude was so special. Even God was like, that's, that's my dude right there. That's my boy. But King David, as great as he was, King David had a major problem, y'all. He was a human being, just like us. And y'all know human beings are prone to make mistakes. And we sin against a holy God. Parenthetically speaking, I'll put this in parentheses, somebody might say, well, wasn't Jesus a human too? Yes, he was a human being who was Mary's child, but he was also divine as God's son. 
In the words of gospel recording artist Fred Hammond, he is not just a man. He is God. So Jesus was and is sinless. But David, like us, was a sinner. How do we know? Because the Bible teaches us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in the men's Sunday school class today, they reminded us that all means all. That's all. All means everybody. We all got issues. And our biggest issue is sin. So this psalm we're looking at today was written by King David, the strong, mighty warrior the giant killer. We're looking at today what I call the Bathsheba affair. This is the setting behind why these verses were even written. We're going to get to my three points and then we'll go home. But I got to share with you all what was going on in David's life when he wrote this because it just might illuminate you and explode and open up this verse like a blossom on a flower and give you a better understanding of what happened in verse 3, 4, and 5. Verse 3, 4, and 5 of Psalm 32. I'll read them in your hearing as you said. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Selah, interlude, pause, think about it. Verse 5, finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. You see, what was going on at the time is what I call the Bathsheba affair. Some of my Bible students know exactly what we're talking about. There may be some others who may not know. It was scandalous. It was more salacious, ratchet, and messy than all of those so-called real housewife shows that has ever come on TV put together. It was an ancient soap opera filled with lust, adultery, lying, a cover-up, a conspiracy, and murder. It was bad. You see, the Bathsheba affair was even more more shameful than what former President Bill Clinton found himself in with the Lewinsky affair back in the 1990s, less than 30 years ago. He and King David had some interesting parallels, things in common, because when President Clinton was president, y'all, the United States actually had a surplus. Now, normally when you look at the news, they always talk about how we in debt and we have a deficit. But when Clinton was president, for the first time since 1969, the United States government actually had money left over. They had a surplus. And I know surplus and deficit, those are accounting words. You might not be as familiar with that. But all y'all know of a deficit. When you get to the end of the month and you ain't got no more money, and the cable bill still needs to be paid, you still need gas in the car. So when you're in a deficit, you start cutting programs. We won't have cable this month. We're going to have to take the bus for a few days because we ain't got money for the gas. That's a deficit. But a surplus? Good God Almighty. A surplus is when you get to the end of the month and you got something left over. Hush your mouth. Look, a surplus is when you have something left over, you have enough to put some to the side for yourself. Let's call that savings. You have enough to do something special for yourself. Let's call that get your swag up and travel and get your clothes and stuff like that, them new high heel shoes, that hat you wanted. And then you also have enough to just give some away. Can you imagine a surplus like that? Enough to save, do something special for yourself, and to do something special for somebody else? Sure would be nice, preacher. Let's turn that dream into a prayer. Lord, make it possible. Bless me in such a way in my house that we have enough to save, enough to 
spend and enough to give away. But when Clinton was president, the country actually had a lot of extra money. When David was the king of Israel, his country prospered and was doing quite well. President Clinton was known as a really cool president when he played the saxophone on the first black late night talk show host, Arsenio Hall. President Clinton was doing well and sitting on top of the world, just like King David, until Bill Clinton saw this PYT, as Michael Jackson would say, PYT in the Oval Office. Y'all don't remember the Thriller album PYT? I'll remind you, PYT stands for Pretty Young Thing. Bill Clinton saw this pretty young thing in the Oval Office, and he almost got fired from his job as the President of the United States of America for having what he said was an improper physical relationship with that pretty young thing. He did things with that young lady that he should have only been doing with his wife named Hillary. It was a really bad situation for him, the young lady, his wife, and those of us who lived in the 90s, it was messed up for the country. Every day they were talking about this. People from other countries laughing at us. Oh, this is how they get down in America. They presidents sleeping around with PYTs. This is it was looking bad. <sighs> but as bad as that was, we just talked about President Bill Clinton. Let's call him King Clinton. But as bad as that was, King David, who wrote today's scripture, Psalm 32, after he did some things that got him into even bigger trouble than King Clinton, one day, King David, when everybody was at war, all the military was out fighting, David decided, I'm going to hang back. I'm going to chill at the palace. Kick back. Kick my feet up. Hang out. Now remember, the scripture says he was supposed to be out fighting with his mighty men. Teach up a moment, as Deacon Robert Singleton would say. When you are not doing what you're supposed to be doing and where you're supposed to be, Satan takes advantage of your disobedience and sets a trap for you to fall into. Y'all believe me? Try to pay attention. King David was lounging one afternoon on top of his palace and looked out and saw a woman named Bathsheba bathing. Splish, splash, she was taking a bath. Remember, he was supposed to be out with his boys fighting. He just lounging at the palace. And what does he see? Hmm. David, who had multiple wives as the king of Israel, could get with any of them whenever he wanted to, looked up and saw this foxy brown Megan the Stallion bathing. <laughs> Fellas, please pay attention. He looked, he lingered, then he lusted. Simple formula. He looked. He lingered, just focused on what he saw. And then he lusted. Mm. Church is 2023, and it seems like everybody's wearing clothes that advertise what's under those clothes. From little girls to great grandmamas. They're wearing skirts, dresses, blouses, and pants that are like three, four, five sizes too small. But us fellas ain't no better. Some of us extra large brothers are showing off our beach body with extra small t-shirts. If we have a t-shirt on at all. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, like King David, we're bound to see something that catches our eye as we go through our day. We are prone to look, linger, and lust just like he did. But I'm here to warn you and I'm here to warn me that sometimes you can't help but to look, but you don't have to linger because lingering leads to lust and then we're liable to do what David did in the next step. 
Well, preacher, this soap opera getting pretty good. What are you doing the next step? <laughs> Episode two. David asked his servant. He saw that Foxy Brown Meg stallion. I thought, woo, we got it. Woo. Hey, who is that? The servant told him, that's your soldier Uriah's wife. In other words, to make sure you don't fall behind, the servant said, dude, that's somebody's wife. The woman you lusting after, he's Uriah's wife. He's in your military, one of your most faithful servants. Whatever. This is where King David takes it further than King Clinton because Bathsheba, what he did, he said, he knew who she was, told the servant, hey, tell her to come here. Y'all know that. You out of the club, on the street. David had servants to do like, come here. Brought her to his palace, laid down with another man's wife. At least Monica Lewinsky wasn't married with Bill Clinton. But anyway, this is where King David takes it further than King Clinton because Bathsheba went home after they did what they did that they never should have did. And shortly thereafter, she sent King David an email, a text message, instant message on Facebook, a DM on Insta Instagram. She picked up the phone and called him. Oops, no, that tech but technology wasn't invented until about 2,800 years later. So she told one of his servants, Tell your boy, I just missed my punctuation mark. Those who are laughing know what punctuation marks are. Aaron taught kids what punctuation marks were in school. You got question marks, exclamation points, commas, and then you have periods. She missed her. And David got a text message from his servant. The text message, not a lot, a whole lot of single brothers want to get. Not a whole lot of single brothers real happy about getting that text message. She's pregnant. David got another man's wife. Pregnant. And it all started because he looked, he lingered, and then he lusted. Episode three, David then said, hmm, I need to cover this thing up. Remember the scripture we just read? He said, I eventually stopped trying to hide my guilt. David said, I'm, I got a scheme. I'm going to get Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, come home from fighting in the war, lay with her so that it will seem like Bathsheba was really pregnant by her own husband. What a scheme, ain't it? Couldn't you see him? I got this hand. That was his plan. Brought your ride home. Said, go home, hang out with your wife. You've been fighting all this time. You're all like, nope, I'm cool. I'm gonna just, I just want to serve. This ain't the time for all that. We're we at war right now. They'd be like, okay, since you ain't really hearing me, uh, I'm gonna take you out to dinner in the palace and I'm gonna get you drunk. And then I'm going to see if you'll go home and do something with your wife that I really want you to do with your wife so I won't look bad. And Uriah's still like, no, nah, man, the homies out there fighting in the war. I'm here with my wife. I can't do that. They out there intense, man. I can't go that route. So David's plan didn't work. So David came with another plan, and he said, you know what? Since he ain't going to do what I want to do, I'm going to send him to the front line of the war. And y'all know in those video games that had a little war things, the people on the front line get killed first. Yeah. So it said, Joab, commander of the army, send Uriah to the front of the battlefield to make sure he gets killed real quick. So after David had Bathsheba's husband Uriah killed, Bathsheba, the woman he slept with, he moved her into his palace along with his other wives. He had other wives. And she had his baby and her husband was dead and it all started because David he was someplace he shouldn't have been he shouldn't have been at the palace he should have been out fighting and while he's at the palace he looked he lingered then he lusted 
Before we get to the text and our three little points and go home, I want to ask y'all a quick question. So how long do you think it took for David to repent? Because you know he was a man after God's own heart, a mighty warrior, giant killer. He was awesome, mighty king. He was doing things. How long do you think it took him to finally say, oops, I made a boo-boo? Hmm. The answer is, according to most theologians, nine months to a year of refusing to confess his sins to God. And somebody might ask, nine months after he did all that, he held on to that for nine long months? I wonder what that time was like for David. What was he going through them nine months? How did he feel? Because the Psalms are about feeling happy, love and pain, joy and happiness. How did David feel? when he was refusing to repent and confess his sins for nine long months. Family, let's take a look at King David's journal. Psalm 32, verse number three. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. That's what it was like for David, holding on to his sin, nurturing that thing like a teddy bear, refusing to confess to God what he did. And he said, my body wasted away. I groaned all day long. My strength was gone. In Greek, the word groaning simply means a cry for distress. It means you're just uncomfortable in spirit. You have no peace for nine long months. That was David's experience. My refusal to confess my sin affected me physically and emotionally. My body wasted away. I groaned all day long. It took away my strength. I didn't want to do nothing. My life wasn't clicking. Things wasn't working right. Couldn't, I was frustrated all the time. We must make this note that this is not always the case. Sometimes we get physically sick or emotionally depressed or anxious, not because of our sin, but other reasons based on trauma we may have experienced, Dr. Tinsley, or at the hands of others, grief, life circumstances, or just because there's problems with the way our brain works. It's not necessarily because you sinned and did something wrong. When we're sick, we're groaning, we have no strength, That's not always because we committed some sin. However, in David's case, he looked around on his bed of affliction like, okay, did I do anything to cause all this? And he realized that he had some messy mess in his life that he refused to deal with. This experience of King David is like the child who breaks a lamp in his parents' house, then tries to hide the lamp under the bed in his parents' house, as if they won't notice the big lampshade sticking out from under the bed. Now the kid is nervous, fidgety, and scared like Adam and Eve eating the fruit God told them not to eat, and they were naked and ashamed and tried to cover up, somebody say cover up, cover up what they did. And us too, we do dirt, y'all know it, we do dirt as if God doesn't see us and doesn't know what we've done. Then we walk around on edge hoping nobody finds out and there's no pictures on social media. Then we get to verse number five, our last verse of the day. Finally, this is King David. This is where his victory comes in. He's taking his victory lap right now. Finally, I confess my sins to you and stop trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me in all My guilt is gone. The first point was my guilt caused my groaning. That was the first point. My guilt 
caused my groaning. This other point, my guilt I confess to God. My guilt I confess to God. I stopped trying to hide this thing. The Bible says, finally, David said, finally I confess. Yeah, David, after nine months to a year, you finally confess your sins. What caused David to sit back, take time, contemplate, and think about his wickedness and finally repent? After nine months, what was it that got his attention? Sarah, what was it that caused him to say, hmm, maybe I ought to think this thing through? What got David's attention? He was a king. Everybody would do whatever he wanted them to do. And don't get mad at Bathsheba because he was the king. She just did what the king told her to do. And that's a whole different sermon that will come up later. But the point is simply this. What got Nathan's, uh, what got Daniel, David's attention? His friend named Nathan. He was a prophet. And Nathan confronted him. Nathan, a prophet. Prophets don't bow down to kings. Prophets tell kings when they're wrong. Prophets like, uh, like Squidward on Spongebob, you're doing it all wrong. Nathan said, David, homie, my boy, you blew it. Young people and elders alike, if you ain't got a friend who will tell you when you're wrong, you ain't got no friend. Facebook, Insta, and social media might tell you you got 10,000 times 10,000 friends. All them people on your phone, all your followers that you influence and on YouTube. But ain't none of them jokers willing to tell you when you're wrong. You got 10,000 times 10,000 associates and zero friends. Nathan like, no, nah, homie, you can't go out like that. And Nate, David, heard Dave, David heard Nathan, and David said at that point, I've sinned against God. He didn't reject Nathan. He didn't go, man, who are you telling me what to do? How are you going to tell me I'm wrong? You can't tell me nothing. I'm the king, boy. I got this on lock. Get out of my face. David didn't go that route. David was like, man, you got a point. I wrote a soap opera before soap operas were even invented. And here we have in verse 5, David said, I confess all my sins to you and stop trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. When David stopped trying to hide his guilt, it's like the child who tried to hide their guilt from their parents at first we talked about with the broken lamp under the bed. But after they, after they got caught, they simply say, you know what, Ma, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, foster parents, adoptive parents, um, oops, I made a boo-boo. That broken lamp is under the bed. David says, my guilt is gone. You forgave me. God forgave David for his wickedness, and now all his guilt is gone, just like the child who confesses about breaking the lamp. Yes, there will be consequences, but they won't be as bad as if you just kept trying to lie and hide your guilt. Based on what David did, the law said at the time, adultery and murder, he was supposed to be killed. They weren't trying to impeach him like Clinton and Trump. And Trump just get him out of office. No, the law said, oh, dude, you're supposed to die. You slept with that woman and killed her husband. Uh-uh, uh-uh. But God forgave him, and he let him live. He still had some consequences for his actions, but he didn't die. God showed him mercy. And the child that breaks the broken lamb, oops, I made a boo-boo. Yeah, they may have some consequences, like a whooping, being grounded, or their parents might take away their iPad for a few days. But that's not as bad as continuing to try to hide your guilt and lie, and then instead of your parents taking your iPad for a few days, they take it for a few months. I understand many of us might say, you know, well, at least I'm not as bad as King David. At least I ain't as bad as that dude. But remember, the Bible teaches us that, of course, all have sinned. 
But according to first, all of sin, every one of us, we all make mistakes. We all done dirt. We might look clean right now, but every last one of us got some dirt under our fingernails. We know what it's like to mess up. I'll speak for myself. I got my PhD in wrong. I do wrong right. I know how to blow it. I know how to get it upside down, inside out, sideways, and backwards. And I'm probably not the only one in this room who knows that. According to 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, God will reset and re-energize us. Even when we mess up, blow it, after we sin, after we do what we said we never would have done, if we claim to be without sin, like one of our presidents who said he never has to repent, if we claim to be without sin, we are only fooling ourselves and the truth ain't in us. You got no right to be president. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God will change your diaper and clean you up if you come to him. If we stop trying to hide that stuff. So many people are walking around with guilt. They holding on to. Yeah, David held on to it for nine months. Some of us been holding on to stuff for nine years. And guilt is causing us to do stuff that just don't make sense. All because of guilt. Let that thing go. Give it to God. And he'll reset our relationship. He will re-energize our mind, body, and soul. Somebody might say as we bring it to a close, how can my guilt and sin be taken away from me? Just like that in the twinkling of an eye? How is this possible? Well, John the Baptist bragged on his cousin, a Jew named Jesus, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. No, you have may not have committed the same messy, dirty, trifling stuff King David did. But all of us got some mistakes under our belt. And as we prepare to a close, I just want to let somebody know, I don't care if you're 7 or 70, please know that no matter what you did, who you did it with, where you did it, why you did it, how you did it, when you did it, or how long you did it. The story of King David in Psalm 32, 3, 5 is proof positive that God's mercy can reach even you and me. As we rise all over the building today, this is all because of the cross. David didn't have to die for his sins because a thousand years later the only son God ever had died on the cross. You, me, us, them, we don't have to die for our sins. We don't have to hurt ourselves. We don't have to let guilt drive us to thinking about ending our lives because we can do like David and simply confess our rebellion and be able to say like David, all my guilt is gone. So there just might be someone under the sound of our voice on this morning who says, man, I need, I need that mercy. I need that grace. Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And he wants to free somebody from guilt. Nine months, nine years, nine decades. I don't know how long you've been holding on to that stuff. If you're here and you want the Lord to intervene, to free you up so you can fly like an eagle, soar, and not be bound down to the ground by guilt. Somebody wants this Jesus we call the Christ. That's you and you want prayer, feel free to join us. I'll meet you here because I need prayer just like you. I might have a microphone right now, but I blew it. I know what it's like to mess up and do stuff. I wish I was perfect, but I can't brag about that. 
So if you're here and you want prayer to ministers, and I will meet you right here. There might be somebody else who says, you know what, preacher, as the ministers come, there might be somebody that says, preacher, you know what? Man, I was in church. I didn't got baptized. I know what it's like to follow Jesus, but I got out there in the world, and I looked, and I lingered, and I lusted, and everything started falling apart. If that's you, you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, he will reset, re-energize, and rededicate you if you want. And finally, there might be someone under the sound of our voice who says, hey, you know what? This Jesus stuff is all brand new to me. But guilt is something I know something about. I would like to be forgiven. I would like to know that one second after I die, I will be in the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you want to be saved this morning, the formula is real simple. It's a two-step process. Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. So lastly, if there's anyone, no matter where you are, what's going on, we don't have to know everything. That's okay. You make sure God knows. If you want to join us in prayer at the altar, feel free to do that. You want to wear your mask and come up, we won't be offended. If you want to join us, feel free at this time. Amen. Those online with us this morning, we can't see you, but you can see us. You can call us at the phone number on the screen. Send us a message on Facebook. Do whatever you got to do. Let us know how this message and what's going on here at Mount Calvary has impacted you. And we will answer. Just like our great God will answer your prayers. So we'll prepare to close and give the benediction. Are we ready for that? Amen. We'll prepare to close. Um, one footnote, if you will, if you got like 30 seconds to spare. And Pastor Dennis asked me to preach. Like, yeah, okay, I'm down. I'm down. I ain't preaching a while, but I'm good. I'm ready to send me out. And Big and Tyrone, I went and got me a new razor and a new shaving cream. And like the day after he called me, asked me to preach. I'm shaving, man. And I did something I ain't done in like years. I cut my hair. I had this gash on my head. My daughter Stephanie looking at me like, Daddy, you come out of Friday the 13th nightmare on Elm Street. You can't be up in a pulpit looking like a zombie. <laughs> Talking to my wife, honey, some got to be. I can't stand up there in the pulpit with this big old, my white meat showing on my head. She said, honey, I, I think I saw somewhere they got band-aids for black people. I ain't got no lie to tell. Oops, I made a boo-boo. That razor was new and it was really sharp. Oops, I made a boo-boo. And my wife comes in, so I'm gonna go to the spot and get you one of these. She got up there, they got light skin band-aids, medium skin band-aids, oh, 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 and they got dark skin band-aids. Dark skin right there. Oops, I made a boo-boo. Oops. I made a boo-boo. And Band-Aid made of dark skin bandage to cover up my boo-boo. Just like God covered up David's boo-boos. And he wants to do the exact same thing for you. Let's pray. Our great God and Father, in the mighty name of your Son, our Savior, we still call him Jesus. We do thank you for this day that you have made. Use this word, this message, this time, this experience, your spirit to change our hearts, whether online or in person, and give us the ability to live with power and conviction as a witness to your mercy and your grace. Give us mouths 
response to tell people, text to text people, DMs on Instagram to let folks know that God is a forgiving God and that you love us with a love that goes beyond all understanding. In the name of the one who died, was buried, but rose up from the grave with all power in his nails guard hands. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said amen and amen. Go out and help somebody. <laughs>